Okay, so hello, my name is uh, Ben Hapley, and today I'll be presenting our work on global optimality and neural network training. Uh, this is joint work with Renee Vidal done at the Johns Hopkins Center for Imaging Science. So if you're at CVPR, it's pretty much impossible to not know what deep learning is or how well it works in a wide variety of applications. Uh, but despite the sort of overwhelming experimental success of deep learning, there's still uh, very significant questions about how it works from sort of a theoretical perspective. And uh, some of the basic questions you might ask about deep learning, just first of all, are, are there principled ways that we can design networks? Uh, then once you've designed your networks, uh, how do we train neural networks? So we know that the network training problem is non-convex, but can we say anything else about it? Uh, can we make any guarantees about converging to global optimality, not getting stuck in poor local minima, these sort of things? Uh, beyond that, you might ask, you know, can we guarantee anything about the performance of neural networks? So for example, how do neural networks generalize to new data? Is there ways we should be regularizing neural networks to improve their performance? Uh, are neural networks learning sort of appropriate decision boundaries, or are they perhaps learning very complicated decision boundaries that might suggest that they're overfitting? And really, all these questions are actually somewhat interrelated in our view. So it's been argued that you know, the way that you optimize neural networks, for example, can impact how well your neural network will generalize. Uh, likewise, changes in the architecture have been shown to have strong effects on how neural networks generalize. And one might expect that you know, perhaps certain architectures of neural networks could perhaps be easier to optimize than others. And so in today's talk, we're going to primarily focus on sort of the optimization corner of this triangle, but also touch briefly on some of these other areas. And the main question that we're going to ask is, are there properties of the neural network architecture that allow for efficient optimization? And the answer is that there are, and these properties we're going to call positive homogeneity and having parallel subnetwork structure. Uh, after that, we're also going to ask, are there properties on the way that we regularize networks that can allow for efficient optimization? And again, a property that will be important is positive homogeneity. And in addition, we're going to actually not necessarily assume that the architecture is fixed a priori at the beginning, but we're going to allow the architecture to kind of be adapted to the data via regularization. And this is going to sort of build on ideas and uh, generalize on ideas originally proposed by Yeshua Bengio and colleagues in 2005. OK, so from this framework, then, we're going to be able to show a few things about the optimization problem in neural networks. And in particular, we'll be able to show that if you have a local minima such that sort of a piece of your network is all zero, then that's actually a sufficient condition to guarantee that you're at a global minimum of the neural network training problem. In addition, we'll be able to show that once the size of the network becomes large enough, then you can guarantee that local descent will reach a global minimum uh, from any initialization. So in effect, you're guaranteeing that all local minima will actually be global minima, and you won't get trapped in sort of these poor local minima. All right, so to begin, we're going to start out by describing network properties that will sort of allow this framework to be developed and that will allow for efficient optimization. And the first property that will be important is what's known as positive homogeneity. And so positive homogeneity, all it really means is if you start with a network, it has some weights, which I've denoted here as W1, W2, Wn3. It's producing some output, which I'll denote as x. And what positive homogeneity means is if you just scale all the weights in your network by some non-negative constant alpha, uh, then you want the output of your network to scale by that same constant raised to some power. And so for just notation purposes, uh, we'll define this network mapping from the weights into the output by a, a capital phi, uh, assuming that the training data is fixed. And then we want this phi function, which maps from the weights into the output to satisfy this positive homogeneity property. And this power p that we raise the alpha to in the output is what we'll refer to as the degree of positive homogeneity of the network mapping function. And even though this is a very simple property, it's actually very rich in terms of describing uh, sort of what gets done in modern neural networks. Uh, and many modern neural networks will actually satisfy this property. So to just take a simple example here, if you just have a single rectified linear unit, uh, here I've drawn one with three inputs. These inputs are weighted by weights w1, 2, and 3. So if we scale these weights, uh, you know, this passes through the sum, obviously. Everything's linear at this point. And then when we pass alpha into the rectification function, the important thing to note is that because we've constrained alpha to be greater than or equal to 0, it doesn't change the sign of z. And so it doesn't really affect the, regular, or the rectification. And so as a result, you know, we can move alpha outside of this max function. And then we see that this rectified linear unit is positively homogeneous with degree 1. 
Right? And so now if we compose networks from a bunch of blocks which are all themselves positively homogeneous, then the overall network will also be positively homogeneous. So here I've sort of drawn just a little simple architecture with some convolutional layers with ReLUs, max pooling, linear units, et cetera. And if we just scale the parameters of this first convolutional layer, as we just saw, that'll scale the output of this layer by alpha. Now if we go and scale the weights of the second convolutional layer by alpha, this will again scale the output by alpha, but since the input was also scaled by alpha, these two multiply and you end up scaling the output by alpha squared. Right, this passes into the max pooling, and as we saw before, we can move this alpha squared outside of the max function. You're not changing the ordering of any of these variables, so the max will still be the same. It's just now been scaled. And so this passes through max pooling. Likewise, you scale the weights of the linear layer. The alphas again multiply, and you end up with a network that's overall positively homogeneous with degree three. And this isn't an accident. You know, typically for most of the layers that get used, uh, each weight layer will typically increase the degree of positive homogeneity by one. And there's many different types of neural network layers that are positively homogeneous. I've just made a list of some of them here. There's many more that aren't on this list. Um, but one important thing to note is that things such as sigmoids and arctangents are not positively homogeneous. All right, so the second property on network architecture that's going to be important to build our framework is what we call parallel subnetwork structure. And what we mean by that is you just want to define uh, a network so that it's composed of subnetworks with an identical architecture all connected in parallel. And so really the simplest example of this is just a neural network with a single hidden layer. Right? So here, the subnetwork is actually just a single ReLU unit. In this case, it has three inputs and two outputs, and you just connect a bunch of them in parallel. But there's nothing that says we need to constrain ourselves to just sort of basic ReLU units. Uh, really, our framework is compatible with any positively homogeneous subnetwork being used. So here I've defined a more complicated subnetwork with now four hidden layers, and I've connected three of them in parallel. And all this falls within our framework. And if you really want to go crazy, you could do something like define your subnetwork to be AlexNet, which is positively homogeneous with a very minor modification. And then you could connect all these in parallel, and it would still sort of fall within this analytical framework that I'm describing. All right, so now that I've defined uh, properties that are sort of important for the architecture, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about regularization. And so there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can potentially regularize neural networks, but you know, arguably the most basic is to just do something like weight decay. And so weight decay, if you do something like L2 weight decay, if you have this network here with you know, sets of weights W1, 2, and 3, all you're really doing is adding something like the square of the, the weights, right? So you're just penalizing the square of the weights in your objective function. And the thing to note is because you're just squaring these weights and summing them up, this regularization function theta is going to be positively homogeneous of degree 2. As we saw before, because this neural network has three weight layers, it'll typically be positively homogeneous with degree three, let's say. And here you can see that the degrees of positive homogeneity don't match between the regularization and the network mapping. And it turns out that this is a very bad thing to have happen. And in particular, you can show that if this is the case, you're pretty much always guaranteed that non-optimal local minima will exist in the error surface of this neural network training problem. So we're gonna, what we're going to propose instead is to actually just start with a neural network uh, with sort of these properties that we defined before. Now we're going to take the weights from one of these subnetworks, and we're going to define a regularization function on the weights of this subnetwork, which we notate by little theta. And the only requirements that we're going to place on this little theta function are that it needs to be non-negative, and it also needs to be positively homogeneous with the same degree as the network mapping. So again, we want these alpha to the p powers to be the same between the regularization function and the network mapping. So a typical example of this would be to some, do something like take the product of the norms of all these weights. So here we have five weight layers. This will be positively homogeneous with degree five, and the degrees will typically match. And so now once you've done that, we're just going to sum these theta functions over all the weights in all these different subnetworks. So we add subnetwork three, two, one, and we define this regularization function capital theta over all the weights in our network. And now one of the key ideas is we're not going to necessarily assume that the number of subnetworks has been fixed a priori, but we're actually going to allow that to be variable. And the main idea behind this is if you add a subnetwork uh, to your overall network, you now are also going to add another term in this summation over theta. And so this regularization is in some sense going to sort of act to constrain the number of subnetworks by penalizing the addition of additional subnetworks in parallel. 
All right, so now I'm gonna try to tie all this together and sort of reiterate what you can do once you sort of have developed this framework. So uh, just to remind ourselves of the original problem, you know, we're interested in solving this non-convex problem, optimizing over the weights in this network. And here, theta is this regularization function that I've just described. And here, the loss function, uh, we're just gonna assume is convex and once differentiable on the outputs of the network. And so this is typically satisfied by many commonly used loss functions, such as the cross entropy loss or the least squares loss. Uh, but remember, the, the overall problem is still non-convex due to the composition with this network mapping fee. Okay, so why do any of this that I've talked to you about? And the, the answer is, it's going to sort of let us induce a convex function on the network outputs. So here the loss function is the same as before, but now I've introduced this omega function. So what's this omega function? And the answer is, this omega function comes from the regularization that we've defined. And so if you give me a network output x, what the omega function does is it says I wanna search over all possible networks that can produce x as an output, and I wanna choose the network that minimizes this theta function that we've defined as our regularization. And because of the way this is defined, it has the important property that omega of x always lower bounds the uh, regularization function. And in particular, you can show that this omega of x is actually a convex function on the network outputs. And so from that, you now have a convex problem which provides an achievable lower bound for the non-convex problem, which is what we actually care about. And so from that, you can kind of use tools from convex analysis as a way to study the non-convex problem that we're actually interested in. And so then, uh, building on all this framework, you can finally get to the results. And basically, the first result uh, provides sufficient conditions on global optimality, which says that if you have a local minimum such that one of these subnetworks is all zero, then you're actually guaranteed to be at the global minimum. And the intuition behind this, oops, oh, I've lost my screen. Okay, well, I'll just continue without slides. Uh, so the intuition behind this is because you have this global minimum of the non-convex, or sorry, because you have this local minimum, you can actually show that that local minimum of the non-convex problem satisfies conditions for optimality of the convex problem. And because you have this global lower bound, you're now guaranteed that that will be the global minimum of the non-convex problem. And then the second result, which I can't show the slides for because we're having technical difficulties, is the one that I stated at the beginning. And that is, if you have um, a network which is large enough, and by large enough, I mean there's enough of these subnetworks connected in parallel, then you're guaranteed that all the local minima will be globally optimal. And so uh, that's by and large what I was gonna talk about. I can't really show my conclusion slide, but uh, I'll be happy to discuss any of this in more detail at the poster.